breakfast puppies? This podcast contains adult language and content and is meant for mature audiences. Listener discretion is advised. Hi, I'm Kevin Sambita of Palladium Books, and you're listening to The Glitter Boys. So, it's just Jacob along here with Matthew and NPC, and we're back with Kevin from Palladium. Today, we're talking about the glorious history of Heroes Unlimited. And I got questions, Kevin. <laughs> I got so many questions, especially and since we started having these conversations, the questions have just grown because I knew you were into comic books. I did not realize how much of a fiend you were back in the day and uh, how far your fingers had gone in the field and all of the connections you had. So let's just start there. Where did the nucleus for doing a hero's role-playing game start over there at Palladium Books? You know, strangely enough, it it, it kind of came a few years into the release of, of our first game. Uh, everyone assumed that my first game would be a superhero game because I loved comic books. Uh, you know, I, as you mentioned, Jacob, I was kind of dabbling in the field. I knew lots of comic book people. Uh, in the 1970s, Detroit was sort of a hub for comic books, and the running joke at Marvel Comics, in fact, was that all the new all the new talent comes from Metro Detroit. They get work in New York and move to L.A. <laughs> and because it did, I mean, Terry Austin came from there. Richard Buckler came from there. Tom Orzakowski, who's a letterer, would go on to uh, work for. Uh, uh, Todd McFarlane and Spawn, and, and a whole lot of others. I mean, Jim Starlin, the guy who created Thanos, you know, all kinds of people uh, came from this area. Keith Pollard, uh, Arville Jones, Al Milgram. I mean, there's just a gazillion guys. Uh, I, I, if I recall correctly, I think even Walt Simonson came from a neighboring city. So, and that was cool for me because it made comic books seem like like my breaking into comics could be a reality because all these guys I knew were were breaking into the industry. I mean, I, I personally knew Terry Austin, not not well, but I mean, I, I knew Terry. Tom Orzakowski was actually something of a mentor to me and Alex, uh, as was Arvel Jones. So, you know, it seemed like a very real thing that could happen. And, you know, I had talent. It was awesome. And plus, you get to hear these guys' stories, you know, and you see their origin story. Like we saw Jim Starlin's, Alex and I saw Jim Starlin's portfolio before Marvel did because oh, he wow. was like, he was fresh out of the, uh, fresh out of the army. And uh, there's this young guy, he's in fatigues. I mean, older than us by a few years, I think. And uh, we certainly had that impression. And he's like, hey, guys, he's at this little comic book convention that a buddy of mine, uh, Mike Kacharski, had thrown called Tricon. And it's like the last day of the convention. We're all like kind of closing up, getting ready to go home. And he's like, hey, guys, you know, I heard you guys talking and you're comic book fans and artists yourselves. Could you take a look at my portfolio and see what what you know, you think of it and we're like, yeah, sure, buddy. We look at this and we're like, holy cow, this is amazing. Because <laughs> he was super talented, right? And uh, very dynamic art style. Uh, and then we saw him like six months later at another convention. And we're like, Jim, how did it go? Did you get work? And he goes, no. And we're like, no. <laughs> He's like, well, can I show you my new portfolio? <laughs> because he went to Marvel and he said, hey, kid, you, 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 you draw really well. Um, we really like your style. But this is all original material. Mm. We want to see if you can draw Marvel characters. Yeah. Okay. So his new portfolio was filled with, like, Spider-Man and Captain America and everybody else. So we're like, oh, man, it's just better than ever. So, I mean, that, that was just, you know, very cool. You know, and, and, and another – so with the big convention here – uh, back in the day was uh, the Detroit Triple Fanfare, which was pretty amazing. Uh, it was one of the first multimedia conventions 
So, for example, I got to meet Gene Roddenberry and hear some of his stories. I got That's to cool. meet um, George Romero, um, the guy who yeah, traded yeah. the title of Living Dead. And in like 1971 or 72, you know, he brings the uncut version of oh. uh, everyone has seen now, but he brings the uncut version of Night of the Living Dead. Plus, we get to see this new movie that's coming out soon called The Crazies. Oh. We were the first to see it like two months before it was released. And, you know, we get to hear his story. We get to ask questions. You know, we get to walk up and chit chat with him a little bit. And it was, you know, and here's another guy who small time filmmaker makes his movie you know on on a short budget in pennsylvania and so all of this is like man, we can do this we, yeah. we can be creators like all these guys so that, that was all an early inspiration and then uh strangely enough with 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 heroes unlimited it would, would be the the third big rpg release from palladium because you know i got involved in role playing with fantasy and got caught up in the whole fantasy thing and then we did Mechanoids as a small thing to release, as we discussed in an earlier episode. And just people were like, Kev, you're not coming out with a superhero game? And I'm like, it's percolating, man. Yeah. It's, it's percolating. And all these other games came out, and people were like, dude, you're too late. Mm. You know, there's like 14, 15 different, you know, superhero role-playing games out there. You know, and, and, and I'm like, it's just not there. And then and they, finally... I don't know. Things just started to click and I knew what I wanted to do. I, I really do. A lot of times ideas really do what I call percolate. I mean, I can feel them in the back of my yeah. head and it's just kind of developing. The and then at some is point it's it. like, boom, we're ready. It's ready to release. And then once the ideas came, I mean, they just it poured out of me and came up with Heroes Unlimited. Yeah. Let it cook. Let it cook. That's right. <laughs> when did you start, like, putting pen to paper on it? Um, it was, I mean, I had made notes, so I'm, I'm a note guy. So I'm always making notes on stuff. In fact, it was funny, you know, I, I, I have my copies here. Even though it's an audio podcast, mm. I have copies I can show you guys of stuff. <laughs> yeah, I have to side note there that we do have some people that were leaving comments like, I want to see all these pictures. Mm -hmm. And it's like, well... Maybe someday. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe someday. And to those folks, so, I'm sorry. Yeah, go ahead. No, go ahead. <laughs> no, I'm just saying to to everybody who is really craving to see these things. Unfortunately, this is just an audio only format, but uh, we'll do our best to share what we can. Absolutely. So I had a bunch of papers sticking out of my mm -hmm. my my early Heroes Unlimited first edition Heroes Unlimited, and I'm like, what the heck's this stuff? I should take this stuff out. And uh, one's a bunch of notes from a fan. One's some notes from uh, uh, my ex-wife, Mary Ann. And then there's there's this, which, as you can see, is a handwritten. Yeah. Oh, wow. You know, and it's notes for ninjas and super spies. <laughs> it says espionage agent OCC, cyber agent, gadgeteer agent, operative mm -hmm. agent, wired agent. And then there's like freelance OCC. And it's like, you know, thief free agent professional. And then there's like mercenary OCC, which I don't think even made it into the book. It's like cyborg soldier, academy officer, uh, ex commando, uh, veteran grunt, gizmo tier, dreamer gizmo tier. That mm -hmm. didn't make it to the book. Uh, I don't, I don't think. Nope. Um, thinker gizmo tier, gizzoid. God knows what that is. <laughs> <laughs> gizmo tier. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's kind of fun finding these little, you know, blasts from the yeah. past. And, and you know, that's something too we don't we haven't talked about. But in those early days, I mean, I didn't get a computer mm -hmm. until uh, I think it was Robotech the first book I did really? on a computer. So all this shit is handwritten, and uh, I, I'm really happy. I was really happy once Eric convinced me to get a and Marianne convinced me to get a computer because. You have to really think things through and have a tight outline. Mm -hmm. And even then, you're cutting pieces of paper out and pasting it in an earlier section or a later section. And, you know, and then poor Marianne had to read or someone else, some other sucker had to read my, my chicken <laughs> scratch and type it all in when we we're typesetting yeah. it. And so I was making notes on, on various things, uh, mostly superpowers and, and the character 
categories in, in uh, Heroes Unlimited. Uh, like I knew I wanted to have a super soldier category and uh, mutants, of course. Mm -hmm. I was a huge X-Men fan before it was really popular to be an X-Men fan. And I had all kinds of notes on, on that stuff. And uh, But I didn't really start writing it until after Lady and Fantasy came out in 83. And then Heroes Unlimited came out in 1984. Yeah. Uh, in time for, I think, a Gen Con release. And uh, it did really well right away. You know, just kept rocking and rolling after that. That is freaking amazing that yeah. like you had the, all those strands percolating simultaneously, and they came out in what? Um, out less well, than one a, year, two, two years, year, three years. Year. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. Well, so going back to a discussion from our previous episode about the uh, the last minute cover of the Monsters and Animals book. Oh yeah. This looks to be the opposite. You've mm -hmm. got just this epic four color style piece on the cover oh, of yeah. the first Heroes Unlimited. Yeah, by by Jim Stranko, who yeah. you know is a legend and was certainly like at the peak of his game uh back then. And uh, a lot of people asked me how how we got Jim Stranko. And I said, Well, you know, uh I had my buddy Alex Marcinison who's a great researcher. I don't know how he finds half the stuff he does, especially back in the day before, again, before computers. Mm -hmm. I said, Al, I need to track down Jim Stranko. And he was like, okay. And like two days later, it's like, here's Stranko's telephone number. Nice. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Yeah. Darn. So uh, I, I called Jim Stranko and we chit chatted for a while, told him what we, we do. He had no idea what a role playing game is. I don't think he still really knows what a role playing <laughs> game is. And uh, he's like, well, I want $3,000. And I said, Oof. Um, but, you know, you're a legend. And he was a huge influence on my own art mm -hmm. style and development. I love Jim Starenko's Captain America and Agent of S.H.I.E.L.D. Um, huge inspiration to me. And uh, I'm like, great, let's do it. And he turned in that original, iconic, yeah. gorgeous, one of my favorite covers of all time, really. Mm -hmm. And it's classic Jim Stranko. And again, you know, part of that was a marketing thing. I sat back and went, I want people to look at this and go, wow, I recognize this artist. Because how, how, you know, again, there were 14 role-playing games out, maybe even 20 that yeah. were all based on superheroes, uh, including by that point, Marvel superheroes. Yep. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, how do I stand out? You know, let's, let's hire a legend to do the damn cover. Mm -hmm. And, uh, Hopefully people will take a look at it and like what they see. And, and they did, you know, Mike Gustavich did a bunch of art in it as well. Mm -hmm. and my, my old comic book buddy. And, uh, you know, it, it, it stood out and, you know, 40 years later, it's, it's one of the few superhero games that have stood the test of time. So, yeah, yeah it's unlike a lot of others. It's still there. Yeah, yeah, you know, and I think there's some clunky stuff to it. You know, I, I, I think, uh, you know, I was still experimenting, so it's a little different from Palladium Fantasy. It uses the same basic core rules, mm -hmm. but you know, the educational system is, is different, mm -hmm. and I think a little too complicated. Um, you know, compared to later games like like uh, Beyond the Supernatural and uh, Dead Rain, mm -hmm. where you, know, you have ordinary people and occupations very condensed with with clear skills. You know, I like to give people options, but I think I gave them a little too much options uh, in in that regard. But you know, it's good stuff. The superpowers are great. The superpower categories are great. Mm -hmm. uh, people love those. So, you know, but I'm always experimenting and trying to push the envelope and do, you know, cool different things. I have a question about the the character creation systems that were included in here. The well, I have only ever seen the revised and the second edition, but in the revised, which was heavily referenced in our gaming group, the there's the same bio E system from the Ninja Turtles mm -hmm. it was in there. I don't was that in the first edition as well? No. Oh, okay. It was, nope. it was introduced in the seventh printing. Is that correct? That sounds about right. Yeah. Yeah. A year later, we'd come out with Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. And I just, you know, Eric's BioE rules were just so clean and nice. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
Um, so yeah, when we did the revised edition with a new Stranko cover, Jim Stranko cover, uh, yeah, I decided to incorporate those uh, aspects in there. How was it? Uh, how was it received as you like brought your game forth into this uh, crowded area of other superhero games at the time? I did real well. Mm -hmm. um, I think it was really pretty different. I mean, while there were like fourteen or twenty other games, you know, the the big three, and we were sort of number four, were what the Marvel superhero game, mm -hmm. villains and vigilantes, champions, which never gets the credit it deserves, and uh, and heroes unlimited. Those those are the big four, and uh, you know, villains and vigilantes. So I knew. I knew uh, uh, Jeff D, who, who created that, I think it was uh, a pretty sweet game, but it kind of lost momentum when uh, Champions came out. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, Marvels and Champions were sort of the big thing. And Champions had come out a year or two before Heroes Unlimited. And uh, again, I say they don't get the credit they deserve because, and we had touched on this in an earlier episode too, is everyone, there were these strong preconceived notions about what you could and couldn't do in gaming. Yeah. And one of them was that science fiction, fantasy, that's it. You can't do anything else. And it, and, and it has to all be generic. And Champions comes out, and it was kind of generic, but the rules were, were very different and unique. And I thought their their comic book art, their art was, I didn't think it was very good, mm -hmm. but it had that strong comic book vibe. And it just really took off. And I think with that release, it helped really drive home that, hey, we don't have to limit ourselves to superheroes and or to uh, fantasy and science fiction, which I knew from the beginning. Because I mean, my game was designed to incorporate everything. And I'm like, finally, people are seeing the light. Mm -hmm. But still, it took another, you know, 10 years or at least six, eight years before people started to fool around with you know, things like Shadowrun and, yeah. and uh, Vampire the Masquerade. And that's when, like, I think in Rifts came out around that same time and everyone went, oh, wow, you can do wildly different and unique mm -hmm. settings. And it's like, yes, I've been trying to tell you that. <laughs> <laughs> One interesting thing that um, when I was reviewing Heroes Unlimited for this episode that really I was reminded of, and one of the reasons I was a huge Heroes Unlimited fan is many of the role-playing games that came out during the 80s, and even a few from the late 70s, um, were, they, they chose what their base power level was going to be and really honed in on that power level. Um, and if you went outside that narrow band of what they set up, it could get real clunky to have to be able to run a game that had both Superman and the Punisher in it yeah. simultaneously. I've experienced this with Marvel superhero back in the day, the yeah. old one, when you had somebody whose powers were all considered beyond. You know, yeah. you got a Silver Surfer running around with a Hawkeye, and you're like, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know, <laughs> and. Heroes Unlimited did a really, really good job. And a lot of it is because of the Palladium game system yeah. and the skill system of being able to throw, you know, your God tier level supers side mm -hmm. by side with a professional stage magician who also solves crime yeah. and it actually works. Yeah. And that has always been why I've said, you want to run a superheroes game, go take a look at heroes unlimited because there's some real, real cool ability to bring those very different genres and styles. And I, hats off to you again for managing to pull that off. I don't, yeah, I don't know if you're aware of that, but we say this a lot as <laughs> in this podcast of that. This is one of the, the few systems, the palladium system where you can, where the vagabond can stand next to the baby dragon and still have something or, or dragon hatchling and still have something to bring to the table. Yeah. You know, and that's, that's wonderful. We love that. Thanks. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's, it's very deliberate. It's again, this gets back to my, my comic book roots and, and, you know, my love of all kinds of fiction and heroes. 
So I, I loved, you, you know, super powerful characters are cool, but I, I loved Batman. I loved mm -hmm. Spider-Man. I loved uh, Daredevil and Captain America. You know, how do you make them fit? And, and you know, again, for me, it's all about character and story. So I always tried to find ways to make even what some people, what power gamers certainly would consider a lesser character, yeah, unique and interesting, and have something to contribute uh, to, to to the game. And you know, obviously, a game master who's just into you know power gaming, you know, your your Hawkeye character or your Daredevil character is going to get squished like a bug. Yep. But if you have a game master who's trying to bring about superheroes and the whole wide range of of these characters. It's there, and you just yeah. have to be careful. And then as a game master, you need to give each of those heroes, or each of those players, you know, their moment to shine. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, the Wasp. I mean, talk about someone who gets squished like a bug. <laughs> <Literally>. uh, <laughs> you, you know, it's... But, you know, she works in the comics, and if you pay attention, and, and you know, she works in, in you know, a role-playing game as well, and characters like her. So I wanted to give people a wide range, you know, and again, I adored comic books and I wanted to give them the full range and the full experience mm. of playing whatever kind of character they happen to, you know, pick, whether it's a Tony Stark in, in power armor or a super soldier like Captain America or, you know, a sleuth and badass like Batman, you know, I wanted to give them everything. Mm -hmm. So speaking of flying characters, that leads me to my, <laughs> I wouldn't say favorite, but the most memorable piece of art from this book the is, is this throwaway little piece on page 166 of Revised of a character that in my old circles we called B-Guy. B-Guy was the most recurring villain yeah. in every game we played oh. <laughs> because for some reason the gm was like and ultimately the mastermind of everything is b guy and we're like god damn it not b guy again. <laughs> why not why not yep i i actually think that piece of art do, was that by any chance given to you as like a line drawing because i think it's been used in a couple different fellows i know i've seen him with a yeah. grenade yeah 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 yeah, yeah. It, it was uh yeah definitely line art so you published the original heroes unlimited how was it received it was very well received you know people really liked it and like i said i think i think it stood out because it was different than anything else that was out there um i think the art really resonated with people as well um, and I think people liked the idea that you could play these characters that had, you know, human foibles and, mm -hmm. you know, I think they, they reflected comic books. I mean, they weren't just cardboard characters where it was like, I'm super Bob and I have the power to, you know, of invulnerability and to turn into the human torch. And it's like, okay, that's cool. But you got more nuance here. You got, yeah. you know, and, and can you do a Tony Stark Iron Man, mm -hmm. um, you know, I don't think some of those other games incorporated those elements very well. And then, you know, I mean, I it, we, we kind of jumped past sort of my background in comics, but I mean, uh, I, I read pretty much everything out there, so I was familiar with Wally Woods Thunder Agents and oh yeah, you, you know the 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 D and D or D and D the. Uh, dc comics you know their whole lineup and yeah. marvel you know i i lived ate breathed marvel and i mean i even read the archie comic book stuff with Flyman and the shield and characters like that and so i mean i i was just immersed in in comic bookness you know plus i knew a lot of other guys who were trying to create their own comics and talked about you know the elements of heroic adventure and all that kind of stuff and then I, I did, I, I dabbled in addition to knowing all kinds of, of different people. Uh, Alex and I produced a comic book called A Plus. Uh, it was a black and white anthology that came out in the 1970s. Um, what most people would think of today as, as an alternative black and white comic, mm -hmm. something that, you know, we were 10 years too early, you know, 10 years later, Eastman and Laird and a bunch of other people would come out with black and white comics that just took off. Yeah. 
so sometimes it's not good to be ahead of your time, but, uh, you know, and we had all kinds of cool stuff in there that, that didn't go anywhere. And then I had dabbled in comics. I had done some work for Noble Comics, which are the guys who did Justice Machine and Cobalt Blue. Mm-hmm. Um, I had done some work with uh, B.K. Taylor, who was uh, at the time sort of a hot shot with um, National Lampoon. Uh, he was doing Timberland Tales and uh, the Appletons, I think was the name of the comics. It's just some goofy three-page stuff that was hilarious. And, uh, you know, so I, I, I actually did some some tops trading card uh, bubblegum design science fiction stuff, you know, aliens and monsters and uh, ghosting under Bob because it was his assignment, but he needed help. <laughs> Oh, I know that ghosting under somebody else's assignment very well. <laughs> that, that's, yep, there you go. That's all my work well, in the industry has been is like. <laughs> well, and that was, that was, you know, my, I actually, unknown to most people, I, I'm actually unofficially a, a Marvel comic book artist because I, <laughs> I ghosted on a couple of issues of the Defenders. Ooh. Uh, again, my, my buddy, Mike Dustovich, uh, I forget who the artist was. But uh, Mike Mike was inking the book at the time, and he uh, he needed help, so he reached out to me and said, "Kev, you know, do you have time?" And I'm like, "Yeah, sure, absolutely." Are you kidding me? I, I have to ask because our people will ask us, our fans will ask, "What episodes?" So that they can buy them on the used market <laughs> because they're gonna want to know. <laughs> I, I don't even remember. Oh, you know, no. at the time it was just bang it out. It's something in the '80s, early yeah. '80s, mid '80s. It was crazy. Like I said, I forget who the artist is, and I'm expecting to get tight pencils, and these are like rough layouts. Oh, no. yeah. And I'm like, holy shit. So, I mean, I got to like draw Valkyrie and, <laughs> you know, these other characters. It's like, so first I'd have to go in and tighten up the pencils, and then I'd have to ink it. I could see mm-hmm. why Mike needed a hand because mm-hmm. uh, this guy was just super, super loose. And, uh, you know, and at the time it was just sort of a job. Yeah. In between, I mean, I did pick up those issues, but I, I like I said, I don't remember. Oh no, <laughs> you know what 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 they were, and I didn't get any of the original pages, or if I did, they're yeah. long gone. Um, because Gustavich would have been cool and sent them to me, but I, I don't know. Mm-hmm. But it was just like this little blip. Like I said, it's a couple issues. Mm-hmm. But that that was cool. I mean, like yes, I'm about to break into comics big time. And then right around, so it had to be like around the time Heroes Unlimited came out. It had to be like 80, 85, because what happened is why I never broke into comics is my company just took off. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I was actually about to ask, you're still doing side jobs at this point. When did Palladium become like your only means of income? Like when, when did it become supporting to you in a way that you kind of, you, you focused into it as opposed to into the world um, in 80, 1984 1985 mm-hmm. so so a couple of funny stories is i i asked marianne to marry me in 1983 and we're living in this little i mean little two-bedroom house with uh her her two kids and you know one of the bedrooms is is my library the dining room is 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 my art studio um <laughs> And, uh, you know, because I, well, so I, I decided I was going to put all of my attention into Palladium with the release of Palladium Fantasy in 83. Mm -hmm. So I was making a decent income doing freelance work. And then I, uh, I decided to put all my attention into the company. So I'm, I'm pulling down like, I don't know, six or $8,000, you know, 1983 dollars which is barely survivable for one human being. Yeah. And I, I ate a lot of, in fact, I, I, I have trouble eating macaroni and cheese <laughs> and bologna because I, I would eat that like all the time. I mean, a box of mac and cheese at the time was like 32 cents. Yeah. Yep. And uh, I ate so much of that, that I just, I can't eat mac and cheese. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> So Marianne was was the breadwinner. You know, she was working as a computer data inputter, I think, for an insurance company. You know, so so when I asked her to marry her, I said, and, and Marianne, I want you to understand that if everything goes according to plan, I mean, I've plotted all this out. I've calculated everything. And, uh, you know, by the end of 
next year, 1984, I should be making about $90,000 a year. And she leaned over and kissed me on the cheek and said, I'll marry you anyway. Because she didn't think it was real, right? She didn't (laughs) think it would happen. And, you know, a year later, I'm not Palladium. I'm personally grossing Mm $90,000. And the company is really starting to take off. Uh, and I'm like, you know, awesome. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, you know, this gets back into the realm. I forget if we, if I told the story in the early episode, if we said, wait. So in 1984, another friend of mine, um, Janelle, uh, Jacoyes, So, so we worked together at Judges Guild. Mm-hmm. I shouldn't say together because we were in yeah. different states. I think Janelle was in Ohio. But, I mean, we talked on the phone a lot, and uh, we were Judges Guild's two top artists. Yeah. When I quit Judges Guild, I went off to, to focus all my energy into Palladium Books. And and Janelle did a couple other things with Judges Guild and then did some stuff with some other companies and fell into uh, Coleco as one of their main artists. And so in 1984, I'm at Gen Con, and, and Janelle shows up, and she had already offered me a position to be like mm-hmm. her main artist creative guy at Coleco. And she, she comes and makes this offer again and says, Kev, I really want you. We'll pay you $38,000 a year. <laughs> we'll, uh, we'll, the time. We'll, and, and, and you'll only go up from there. We'll give you a $10,000 moving, you know, bonus uh, that you can use to move and whatever else you want to do. You know, and this is just before Palladium is really starting to take off. Mm-hmm. I had just really, like I said, I debuted Heroes Unlimited at Gen Con. And I'm like, what, you know, and, and leave all of this? And I squeak <laughs> my arms on, I look down at my table, and there's like eight products. Yeah. And and she smiles and says, think about it. Talk about it with your wife. And, so uh, rough. <laughs> <laughs> You know, so it's one of those things like, like, like what happened? What would have happened if I had taken that job? The great you know, cabbage patch crash would have gotten you. <laughs> Ninja Turtles, Robotech, none of that would have happened. None of that would yeah. have happened. Yeah. 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 You know, same thing. I, you know, Jim Steranko just earlier that year it was a weird year for me because all these people are offering me work. You know, Jim Steranko, he's got this great voice. He sounds like Darth Vader. And <laughs> oh, it's <yeah>. like, <laughs> I want you to join me. I want you to be my manager. <laughs> and, and, you know, it's... <laughs> Those of you listening at home, that was Kevin Sambita talking into a mug. That was fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> oh. You know, and, and to me, Stranko was an art god. Yeah. And, and so it meant the world to me that he wanted me to be part of his team and to be his, you know, basically his right-hand man uh, and and help manage him and his company, uh, Super Graphics. You know, he was like, yeah, think about it. I'm like, Jim, I I don't need to think about it. I said, I'm so honored, but, you know, I I have my own dreams and my stuff I want to do, and I I have to say no. Mm -hmm. And he gave me one of the greatest compliments of, of all time for me. Again, especially from coming from a guy who, who I adored and loved his art. It was a profound influence on, on me. And he says, well, Kevin, Kevin, I would have been disappointed if you took the job. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I'm like, what? And he's like, Kevin, you're one of these rare talents who not only are you super creative, but you are a good business person. That's <laughs> <laughs> you know, and I'm like, wow. And, you know, and at the time, I mean, I don't know, I'm 28, 30 years old. And, you know, this legendary guy just, you know, said that to me and you know, he wishes me well. And we stayed buddies for, God, at least a decade mm-hmm. um, where we would talk like every other week, which was pretty awesome. So, you know, it's like, yeah, what if I had taken that job in, for Jim Steranko? What if I had taken the job at Coleco? Uh, everything might have been different. Yeah, especially to there been no turtles, probably no Robotech. Probably would have never met Kevin Long. Uh, yeah. Because all that stuff happened later. So, you know, would have moved away from Eric Widjik. Mm, yeah. But uh, a couple of factors. One, I really knew what I wanted to do with, with, with my life and where I wanted to take 
the company. And, and two, my mom was, was battling cancer and, uh, like death's door. So I had to, I didn't want to leave her. Mm -hmm. So I want to bring this back to Gustavich. You had talked about doing some, uh, shadow work for him earlier. Yeah. And I believe Gustavich's art features very heavily in the first of the heroes unlimited source books. Yeah. And not only does it, it, it factor heavily in, in the first heroes unlimited source book, which was justice machine, mm -hmm. but it was palladium's first licensed property. This was originally a comic book that Mike created. He, he established a company called mobile comics. And again, Mike's, Mike's a sweet guy and he, and he knows his talent. So, you know, I, I, I go to hang out at his studio for a weekend. He brought a bunch of people in. Uh, it was like his house out, I forget where, probably Ohio. And, you know, there, there's guys who would go on to become big time comic book people like, what's his name? Bill Reinhold. He would go on to do mm -hmm. a bunch of great stuff for Marvel. Uh, Bill Willingham, who would go on oh, to yeah. write fables for DC yeah, Comics, yeah. Uh, as it create the elementals. It, it was great you know, all this talent, uh, Jeff D was there or some other folks were there, you know, it was good stuff. Mm -hmm. You know, that was exciting. And he said, Mike, and Mike gave me my first, again, it was an alternative publishing company, but you know, my first comic book job was doing the colors for his, uh, justice machine comic book. Nice. So uh, yeah, that trail of you've known Gustavich, uh, you used Gustavich and heroes unlimited, how did you decide that this was going to be our first supplement? Um, I, I just really liked Justice Machine, and I forget whether I went to Mike or if Mike went to me and said, "Hey, Kev, I think I went to Mike and said, you know, Mike, I love your Justice Machine. Can I can I do a role playing game?" Mm -hmm. uh, and he said, "Yeah, absolutely." Uh, and in fact, you know, we we kind of crossed the streams because you know this the Cobalt Blue and Justice Machine Number no. Five came out in 1982, I think. And uh, 83, 1983, and uh, the Mechanoids appeared in the Cobalt Blue. It was a double, oh, wow. double cover flip comic. And, uh, you know, my Mechanoids were, were there because they thought they were cool and said, Kev, I want to bring in your Mechanoids. And I'm like, <laughs> okay. Oh, that's Heck awesome. Yeah. yeah. Oh, in uh, color, too. Yeah. My colors, by the way. Oh, nice. Yeah. <laughs> And uh, yeah, you know, there's there's a runner. Oh, oh yeah, wow. parents yeah. and you know. So uh, okay, so real quick, which issue is that? So people can track it down. <laughs> uh, it's uh, Justice Machine. Like I said, it's a double issue. Half the book is Justice Machine. Half the book is Cobalt Blue. And uh, Cobalt Blue never was never as big as Justice Machine. So it's uh, Justice Machine number five and Cobalt Blue number five. They're the same book. And uh, Justice Machine, or excuse me, the Mechanoids appeared in uh, Cobalt Blue. Awesome. So you got so, the license to do Justice Machine in 83? Uh, uh, no, we, we got that in 80, uh, 85. 85, okay. The comic book came out in 83. Right, right. And, and, I mean, Justice Machine and Cobalt Blue 5, I think, were the last noble comic issues. Right, because the uh -huh. license went to Texas Comics in 83, and then in 86 got shifted over to Comico. So I was just trying to line things up. and Yeah, yeah, yeah. Know. I mean, so many people have taken a run at Justice Machine. It's mm -hmm. not funny. Oh, um, yeah. You, you look at it, and, I, and I'm fairly certain the Wikipedia page on it's out of date because it shows like eight different publishers, go, you know, and I'm first thinking they're missing one or two that never actually managed to put an issue out but own the IP. Yeah, there's a new guy who, who owns both those properties now. You know, he's talking about bringing Justice Machine and Cobalt Blue back, but, you know, we'll, we'll see. Uh, I guess he bought Justice Machine a couple of years ago, and... Uh, and he's talking about doing some kind of Kickstarter relaunch of some of the old stuff and then uh, doing new stuff. But I think it's still sort of a, a plan in the works. Um, and yeah, it's cool. So the cool thing for people who are fans of Justice Machine, you know, all 15 of you uh, <laughs> out there, it, uh, the source book has never before seen material because Mike just let me run with it. He would, mm -hmm. we'd have these long conversations and he'd give me some of his ideas 
and then we would run and I, it, he would let me run off and do all kinds of stuff so there's more more information about Jorwell, the the world that they mm. come from and uh some of the characters and stuff it was it was very fun and and of course the the mechanoids <laughs> yeah make an appearance in in that as well <laughs> they they tend to work their way into a lot of books that you <laughs> yeah 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 so how many supplements did you do before the 90s for heroes unlimited because i was trying to sort that out and i got lost in a rabbit hole of printing <laughs> years of print runs and that sort of thing um not not too many i mean villains unlimited yep um i think that came out in the late 80s and uh actually says 1992 so 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 not many so what what happened is you know, Palladium Fantasy was one of my main interests. And then Turtles came out, and that was a runaway hit. And thankfully, I had Eric to work on most of those. Mm-hmm. And then uh, Robotech was our next big hit that came out. So we had, like, 83 was Palladium Fantasy. 84 was Heroes Unlimited. 85 was uh, TMNT and Other Strangeness. 87 was Robotech. We just had this slew, you know, 88 was... was uh, uh, ninjas and super spies and uh i think 89 was beyond the supernatural meanwhile i'm working on riffs sort of behind the scenes for you know from like 87 to 90 so we sort of had a lot going and robotech you know that was a, our next big hit so it was nice because i had eric working on turtles which was a hit i had robotech that was a hit that i was working on mm-hmm and then kind of doing other stuff. I mean, I, I got nicknamed the machine by, by Ryan Dancy of Watsy. <laughs> Fair. Because I was writing eight to 12 books a year. Yeah. So, you know, I, I, I sort of was a machine. <laughs> yeah. So let's switch gears at this point and talk about ninjas and super spies. And even though we're, we're jumping over a couple things in the, chronology of your yeah. product run but they're you know Robotech, they're related. yeah they're, yep. robotech and teenage mutant ninja turtles are so epic that, that they're like we're gonna put an entire session to each of those in, in their own right because they were uh genre defining for both the genres they came out of and for role playing in, in such a way um, so we're we're gonna pull those out, and just so listeners don't, we're not we're not forgetting about them. Um, I had heard a story um, at one point that Ninjas and Super Spies was percolating all the way back in '84, and some of the first ideas were getting thrown around for it. And can you basically tell us how? where that started and how it developed into its own thing. I, I sure can. It uh, So that was very much uh, an Eric Woodjuk idea. He wanted to do some kind of martial arts game. He loved Heroes Unlimited. He was involved in something like Playtest mm-hmm. with, with Heroes Unlimited, and he was a big uh, Champions fan, so he liked that genre. And uh, he he himself had dabbled in uh various martial arts like he had mm-hmm. uh i think he was like a second degree something in, in kendo and he was uh had studied aikido for a while and uh something else and so he was very familiar with, with martial arts and thought it would be great to do some kind of martial arts game and then like you jacob i'm i'm a i'm a james bond fan and I said, you know, it would be great, Eric, if we made it like, you know, martial arts and and uh, super uh, super spies, mm-hmm. like like James Bond, only we could t- or, or Nick Fury, Agent of Shield, mm-hmm. you know, take it to that next level. And, and Eric really liked that idea. So you know, and, and Eric, he, you know, he, he's legendary for having banged out the actual writing for TMNT in four and a half weeks. <laughs> But but that's like an, an aberration for him, <laughs> very much an anomaly. And I think that was possible only because he and I had been discussing it for like six months and what we would do, what we felt needed to be in the game. 
Uh, so when he had to jump in, it just flowed out. So something most people don't know is, is poor Eric suffered from uh, manic depression. Yeah. And, and he didn't want to take meds for it because he said it just evened him out too much. He, he liked the highs. He hated mm. the lows. But he goes, when you're on meds, everything's just kind of flat. Yeah. And so you have a great idea, but you don't really fill it. And you can't really tell. And you have a shitty idea. You know, again, you can't really tell. And so there would be years at a time, especially later in his life in the 90s, where nothing, you'd see nothing from Eric. And then all of a sudden he hit a manic phase. And the problem with that is he'd have ideas for 30 different things. You're right. And yeah. he was working on all 30 of them. And it was hard to rein them in and get them to focus on finishing any one, one project. Uh, but when he didn't, he also kind of hamstrung himself with, he was one of those guys who always felt, okay, this is great. The next thing I do has to be even better. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And let's face it. One of the first things published ever from him was Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles and other strangeness. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's a hard, follow. it's hard to outdo Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles and other strangeness. I mean, he was almost a victim of his own yeah. success. So he kind of would hamstring himself uh, with that. I got to outdo myself every single time. So I think that really worked against him. Uh, but the guy was just this creative powerhouse. I mean, he was a true genius in, in game design. And we would talk about game theory and, um, you know, ideas about everything. I would drive my ex-wife crazy because Eric would, you know, we lived very close. So I'd go visit Eric or he'd visit me. And, you know, five hours later, I'm coming into the house. It's, you know, midnight or one in the morning. She's like, <laughs> well, did you guys get a lot of work done on Ninja and the Super Spies? And I'm like, uh. Well, no, actually, we, we forgot to talk about it. <laughs> and she'd be like, what the hell? What were you talking about for five hours out there? And I'm like, uh, like this and that. And we got ideas for a couple new cool books and <laughs> sports books. Because everything, Eric, Eric and I were, were like these two guys who just, everything gave us ideas. Mm hmm uh, I mean, everything. Like, I came up with the idea for the Zytikix and Riffs. I, I, I was at a park, and I was just watching these these bees coming and going mm -hmm. from from their, their mud hive. And it just gave me the idea that, like, what if you had these alien insects? And, you know, we have these levels. They fly out one one level. They fly into the next level. And, yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, where does that go? I mean, how stupid. I mean, it's just... You're watching bugs, but go ahead. Yeah, Matt. Could we get the uh, definitive pronunciation of that one more time for our listeners? Zy Tickix. There Zy it is. That's excellent. That, that, my, dad called them, my dad <laughs> called them city chicks. <laughs> I, I have to go pay somebody 20 bucks from like a decade ago now. <laughs> you, um, I, as you guys have probably noted, most of the time I try to have names that are very pronounceable mm -hmm. that was a kevin long idea the, the, the <laughs> tickets, um their their look and he came up with the name and i said sure cav we'll use that mm -hmm. uh his <laughs> idea for the name and i i wish i didn't because nobody can pronounce it <laughs> and uh hey you know yeah but uh yeah zy tickets Sam Bida. <laughs> <laughs> Those are honestly the, the big two that we get more, more than yeah, anything else. I think so. Yeah, I'm sure. <laughs> I answered anything with an S sound except for shithead. Right. <laughs> you know, because it's one of those crazy Polish names. And I'm always amazed when someone gets it right. Yeah. That's okay. Kevin is yeah. fine. <laughs> you know, we start to see some of, uh, of Kevin Long's art here in Ninjas and Super Spies, too. Mm -hmm. Is it? Is that? No, because this is advanced a little bit. Yeah, it's 88, 1988. Yeah. Yep. yeah. Was was the same art used across the original Ninjas and Super Spies and the revised edition? Yeah, we yeah, we kept most of that. I mean, we probably added some, but yeah. The one real impressive thing about Ninjas and Super Spies is you can take any action movie from the 80s 
and run it in ninjas and super spies <laughs> literally like um any of the return to vietnam na- genre that was around yeah. there grab the veteran grunt grab the academy officer etc cetera, etc cetera. any james bond movie there's an agent class in there that'll mate up with any character uh you know the 80s was also the when ninjas were suddenly super popular you had multiple television yep. shows that had ninjas in them they all dabbled into espionage it it in so many ways ninjas and super spies is like this weird love letter to the pop culture of mercenary films and martial arts films and uh secret agent films that were going on at the time and it's it has stood up so well for modeling that set of genres and the how often those genres crossed over it's just impressive yeah well, i mean again it's it, it, it's just stuff that we love mm-hmm you know, when we do our books, it's it's it, it, a lot of these things are love letters to a particular genre, and you know, I I I, I often joke that I don't have eclectic taste; I have epileptic taste because I'm <laughs> kind of all over the place. And you know, and I, and I was, I guess, a big pop culture kid. You mm-hmm. know, I, I so I was I was really fortunate because my mom loved books she's the one who instilled into me the love of books because she's like kevin you know you can you can go anywhere be anything you read these books they transport you to you know other parts of the country other times other worlds and and i i loved that and she was a voracious reader and then my dad was a film buff uh he, he he grew up in the 40s and he would and he was like sort of an only effectively an only child he had brothers and sisters but he was the child of of, of a second marriage Mm -hmm. you know most of his brothers and sisters were 10 12 years older so and in in his and his mom died sadly when he was 12 and his dad was off you know either working or he was apparently this this great sax player and so he'd be out at, at bars and clubs and stuff so my dad was left kind of alone to kind of run the streets and uh, fortunately, he was into baseball and movies. So the minute he got, you know, a dime back then, apparently, to see a movie, uh, and, you know, you're talking double features plus, you know, six or eight cartoons mm-hmm. and, you know, a news trailer, and my dad would go to see movies. And so he loved movies. And, you know, me, grow, you know, I was born in 1956. So, you know, I'm coming into things in the 1960s and 70s. And, and TV is rerunning all these old, you know, movies with Humphrey Bogart and Cary Grant and all this stuff. And my dad would be like, oh, you're going to love this, you know, and, and oh, The Thin Man, it's a great series. And, you know, oh, dad, you know, most people don't even realize that uh, Blondie, Blondie newspaper strip. Mm-hmm. Hell, most people don't even know about the Blondie newspaper strip these days. But but Blondie and Dagwood were, were a huge radio show. And then they mm-hmm. did a whole series of uh of um, god it has to be at least a dozen blondie and dagwood movies that are just i mean i love them because my dad when they started to rerun them along with like the bowery boys and uh you know that kind of mom and mom mom and pa kettle mm-hmm. you know it's they were great stuff my dad's like oh i love these when i was a kid and you know and of course my dad you know we were close so i'm like oh yeah let's see what my dad loved and they were great stuff and I just loved stories. I love stories and, and cool characters and interesting characters and all kinds of stories. And so between my mom and my dad, you know, I'm a movie buff. I, I love to read, you know, and they thought comic books were cool. They were sorry that they threw out their comics when they were kids. Mm-hmm. So, you know, I, I was, I was an art, I was drawing as far back as I can remember. Uh, and my dad dabbled in art. My dad was a decent uh, kind of cartoony artist style. When I was little, my, my dad had uh, some serious back problems. He couldn't play ball and sports with me, so he would we would sit there and draw pictures together at the kitchen table. Mm-hmm. You know, that helped get me into art. And, and, you know, so, I mean, I was just in this very unique, nurturing environment. 
you know, plus they were cool parents. They were, they were like, Kev, you know, follow your dream, be whatever you want to be. Mm -hmm. You know, and I think, I think later in life until I, you know, got successful, they were like, what have we done? We told him he could be anything. <laughs> this stupid kid, he wants to be an artist, comic book artist. Who wants to be a comic book artist? You know, because back then, you know, that wasn't a cool thing to be. And, uh, you know, and then, you know, one of my famous stories uh, that I tell people, I don't know if I've mentioned it much on any podcast, is my grandpa was sort of a old world guy who grew up during the Depression. Mm hmm so he felt I needed to have a backup profession because let's face it, it's hard to be getting to the entertainment business. And so he always wanted, you know, Kev, you know, as you're getting ready to go to college and he was a cool guy in that, you know, he gave me some money for my first year in, in, in art school, mm -hmm. but you know, he just couldn't believe that I could make it into entertainment business of any kind. And so I was like, you know, his idea of having a backup plan, having a backup profession is plumber, carpenter, mm -hmm. you know, attorney, uh, you know, that kind of thing, you know, auto mechanic, which I am not mechanically inclined. You don't want me to build anything with wood or nails. <laughs> so one day I, I figure out, I come to realize that, you know, Hey, I've got this other talent. So I go, I would visit my grandpa for an hour or two every Sunday after church. And then one Sunday I come in and I'm like, and it was a uh, like, like springtime or beginning of summer. So the windows are open and we lived right next door to my grandparents. Mm -hmm. So so my dad could hear this conversation. And I'm like, Grandpa, I've got good news. I figured out what my backup plan will be. And he's like, That's great, Kevin. What is it? And I'm like, But I can't make it as an artist. I'll be a writer. <laughs> and, and my grandpa's already old and frail, right? And he like no. <laughs> leaps out of his chair and leans over. He's like, oh my God, the only thing worse than an artist is a writer. <laughs> and then you proceeded to have a very lucrative career doing both. Yeah. <laughs> yep, exactly. And uh, my dad was cool. So like, I, I, I was a little flummoxed by that, but I, you know, I'm like, okay, sorry, <laughs> sorry yeah. to disappoint you. <laughs> and uh, I'm walking back to my house and uh, my dad meets me in, in, in the uh, backyard and he's like, Kev, I heard what, what grandpa said. It's like, you don't listen to that old man. You follow <laughs> your dream. You want to be an artist, you be an artist. You want to be a writer, you be a writer. And I'm like, well, thanks, Dad. He wasn't going to derail me. <laughs> but, I mean, I appreciate your support. I mean, it was very sweet. I mean, he was really serious about that. Yeah. You know, he gave me a big hug, and I'm like, it's okay, Dad. I'm good. Yeah. You know, I, but, you know, so I was super fortunate. We, we, were, we were poor, but, you know, the house was full of love mm. and, and good things. And my mom and dad were just creative in their own kind of way very, very nurturing environment. So, I mean, I was able to run wild with my ideas. You know, they never sat back and said bad things about stuff. Like one of my aunts at one point, uh, my, my aunt Irene, she, uh, she's like, you're such a great artist, but all you draw is monsters and superheroes. <laughs> As and I'm it like, turns out. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, so oh, oh, go ahead. Go, go right ahead. Well, this is tangential and uh, I'm, derail things every now and then who's the boxer in your family or are you the boxer in your family because of if if you're ever taking skills and it allows it you're gonna take the boxer <laughs> oh i no, nobody's actually a boxer really? uh, okay we, we we had a famous uh the crunk gym was a famous mm -hmm. boxing gym that was in my neighborhood mm -hmm. um tommy hearns and a bunch of other guys boxed there and then Kevin Long got me into boxing in the early 80s. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, or mid-80s, I guess, it, 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 as a spectator. Mm -hmm. uh, I've never actually boxed, but I found boxing fascinating. I guess I'd kind of discovered it a little before because that's that plays a huge role in my combat system. Mm -hmm. Watching how boxers box. I mean, that's where the idea of SDC came from. So I guess, you know, part of it, I, you know, like a lot of the nation, I was enthralled with uh Muhammad Ali before Kevin Long got me into boxing. Yeah. You know, Muhammad Ali and, and Frazier and, and, mm -hmm. you know, George Foreman, 
and I just, I, I really studied, like I said, I look, that's why I tell people, think outside the box, look, look at everything, let everything give you ideas. And, and so I'd watch boxing and you'd see these guys and they look like they're getting the crap beat out of them. And then all of a sudden, boom, boom, boom. And he knocks the other guy out. And you're like, well, holy crap. You know, and I started to think, you know, SDC came about because I'm thinking, you know, if one of you guys punched me in the stomach right now, I'm going to double over. I'm going to be like, <gasps> can't catch my breath. But, you know, the, the four of us could probably pummel on someone like Mike Tyson when he was at his <laughs> peak. Mm -hmm. And he would just brush it all off and turn around and clean our clocks. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's, you know, and it, that's SDC in action. Yeah. Yep. You know, He'd still clean our clocks. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> One punch for that guy, we'd be out cold. Yeah. So, you know, and, and that's also real life examples of, you know, it, it drives me crazy sometimes when people talk about game balance mm -hmm. and, or a lack of game balance in our, in our games, because as you guys pointed out earlier, you know, you can pay, play a sleuth or you can play Thor. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It, you know, and for some people that's broken because, you know, what's the sleuth going to do? Well, you know, he can do lots of things if the game master is, you know, keeping him in mind and making sure he has stuff to do. You want a guy who's a brainiac. You yeah. want a guy who is going to notice clues and figure stuff out and, you know, notice what could be a trap or an ambush versus the guy who can, you know, in, in video game terms, you know, you have the tank. Mm -hmm. The tank is cool. You want him on your team, but he's not necessarily the guy to figure stuff out yeah. uh, and, and do stuff. You know, I want that range. I want, you know, the, those those capabilities. I want to have all kinds of characters in there that can just, you know, fit whatever people want. I mean, you come on, you guys have game for years. You know, mm -hmm. there are players who always play a particular type of character. They're always the mage or always the smart guy. And then there's the guy who is the tank or the healer or whatever. And, and that's all fine. But I want to give people options to play whatever yeah. they want. And also want to give people options to try other things. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it's it's fun to, to try different types of characters that you might not think you would enjoy playing. Yeah, I love the low power options. Yeah. Um, that just... When you when you have to think instead of like pointing your shiny boom gun at things, it just it just brings a richer game. I've always enjoyed the style of play that comes from random character rolling. Mm -hmm. If I will sit down at a table to play in somebody's game, and if it has random rolling, I like it because that means I don't have to think too hard about what I want to play before I sit down. I can be like, okay. Hobgoblin, that looks pretty cool. I'm going to roll these stats. All right. Oh, this guy could be a so-and-so or whatever. Yeah. And then let that guide me into someone interesting that did not exist before I sat down and rolled those dice. Yeah, exactly. And, and you know, I again, everyone has their own style of play. So I've played with characters, or I should say I've gamed with players who would claim... I just randomly rolled this and I'm like, wow, really four stats that are, you know, 22 or higher. <laughs> that was some pretty sweet rolling, mm -hmm. but I don't care. I don't care that they picked it. Uh, if that's what they want to play, if that's how they want to do it, that's fine. Cause I want them to have fun, but I agree with you guys. They're missing out mm -hmm. on now. I got to think about it. One of the most memorable characters that 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 in fact there's two really memorable characters one was an npc that i played and played in fantasy and another one was uh, a julius rosenstein character uh also from played in fantasy and and julius liked to just do random rolls mm -hmm. so he rolls up this character that that's a wolfen and and he's a badass he's got you know great speed he's got great strength he's got decent uh i mean like 18 physical prowess and uh, an IQ of six. Yeah. And, and, and he named him Fang. And Fang was just this great, he played him like very simple. I don't mean like a simple ton, but kind of simple mm. and straightforward. And the character was just so sincere and heroic that everybody loved this character. And, you know, a lot of people would go, IQ of six, that's unplayable. You know, and, and Julius being a great player, mm -hmm. he would you know, have his character make faux pas, uh, especially in social situations or yeah. do something dumb. Like one of 
one of Fang's favorite characters or favorite characters, favorite weapons was an oak chair <laughs> because they got in combat and, and their weapons they had to get left out someplace and they, they're, they're getting ambushed or, and, and he grabs his big ass chair and he just wipes the floor with the bad guys using mm. this chair and he's like oh this great weapon <laughs> <laughs> he straps it to his back nice and, and he carried a stupid chair around forever yeah i that makes me want to give a shout out i'm running a, currently running a palladium fantasy first edition campaign on weekends and two characters i watched them i watched the players roll these characters resulted in actually really high stats and something else so first we have the kobold the kobold priest is probably the most badass character i oh, think yeah. i've ever seen naturally rolled in a palladium game uh really really fast really really strong <laughs> just just runs up the kobold priest with a knife is the damage dealer of the group <laughs> whereas the there's the elven knight keith keith is beautiful he's quick he's strong and he's dumb as a box of hair he has <laughs> the iq of six i think there's another character in the group who has like an iq of seven that keith considers a brilliant genius <laughs> <laughs> And watching them role play these characters as just these unique creatures in mm -hmm. a world is it's it's wonderful. It fills my heart with it joy. Is, it is it is wonderful. And and it also makes for great moments. There was this one game I'm playing with, of course, Alex and Kevin Long and Stumps and a bunch of guys, and you know, stuff is going on. It, it happened to be fantasy also. And uh Alex says, oh, my, my, I forget the name of his character, my, my character who was a changeling and had changed to look like a demon, a, like, like a, a, um, a pandemonium. Mm -hmm. And he's like, I'm going to run across to join the battle. And I go, great, Al. And I go, wait a minute, what, what's your speed again? And he's like, four. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, you see this pandemonium. Stro slowly strolling across the battlefield, smoking a pipe, <laughs> you know, and, and it's like everyone laughs. There's this great moment of levity in, in this very dramatic battle scene, and, you know, it, it's it's great. I like interpreting roles that way, too. Mm -hmm. Like, you don't always have to interpret everything. Oh, I didn't roll high enough. You failed. Oh, yeah. I rolled high enough. You succeeded. There's always a lot more there, you know, mm -hmm. like, like, again... Our fantasy sessions. Uh, the priest had summoned a gargoyle. Gargoyles are badass. And this is a low level group summoned this gargoyle that we they fully expected to just wipe the floor with every other creature that was attacking them. The gargoyle failed every single one of its combat <laughs> rolls. It just kept failing everything. I remember so this. much that Jacob, who's in my game, it starts coming up with the story about how the gargoyle didn't know he was on call that weekend. <laughs> Therefore, <laughs> he was he was still in the bathtub, and it's just like, what? What's going? Oh no! <laughs> that's that's wonderful. Yeah, that's great. You know, and but that's also that's also why I hate like luck rolls mm -hmm. because the luck is in the dice yeah yep. there's already a mechanic and, and i love it you know yeah you've got you know some some bad guy or some creature you summon and he rolls like garbage i sit back and go it's fate it's part of the story it's supposed mm -hmm. to go this way mm -hmm. you know and it's also epic when you know that guy rolls the natural 20 and takes down you know mm -hmm. the big bad guy uh, I mean, how many games can you say that, you know, it, someone does a heroic action and the whole group jumps up and cheers? Yeah. yeah. You know, it's... Yeah, without the failures, great. the successes mean nothing. So... And that's the thing. That's what I love about role mm -hmm. playing. You know, try playing a different role. Don't don't look at your character and go, oh, my God, he's awful. I, I mean, another great story is i I'm, I'm running this game and, and the player is a great player i he, he's come to the open house i think every open house isaac and uh we're at some other convention i think it wasn't the open house and we're playing a beyond a supernatural game and, and i have these pre-rolled characters and one of the characters is like this 80 year old you know professor higgins mm -hmm. and the group confronts these bad guys are playing great but they they find themselves in a jam i mean and they're they're screwed. It's like I, as a game master, I'm thinking, 
okay, what can I, what bone can I throw them so they can survive? And I'm just, and I'm thinking, <laughs> man, they're, just, they're all about to die. There's nothing anyone can do. And the big bad guys, you know, this arrogant jerk. And, and Professor Higgins asked him to, you know, can you at least, you know, tell us what your plan is before you kill us, you know, horrendously. And, and the guy starts going on and on. And he's like, I've got a pen in my pocket, right? A fountain pen. And I'm like, yeah. And he's like, so I'm carefully taking off the cap and I'm doing it very slowly. So no one notices what I'm doing. And I'm like, okay. And I have no idea where this is going yet. And he's like, yeah. And I'm going to like slowly pull it out. Does anyone notice what I'm doing? And I'm like, nah, if any of the demons or henchmen notice, they're like, yeah, big, big deal. He's got a pen in his hand. You know, he's asking for an autograph. What? I don't know. You know, <laughs> not gonna worry about it. And he's like, and we're standing really close. I mean, like with an arm's length, right? I said, yeah, closer. Cause the big bad guy at one point leans, you know, nose to nose and is like, you guys are fools. You know, we have you now. How could you think you could defeat us? And he's like, all right. Um, you know, I'm, I'm very educated. I understand. I'm not a doctor, but I mean, I understand by you know, uh, physiology and, mm -hmm. And anatomy, and he goes, I, I want to stab him in the neck in his <laughs> juggler vein. The guy rolls a natural 20. Oh, oh damn. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> and, and, and in situations like that, I like to let the bad guy yep. react. So I'm like, okay. I mean, unless he matches your roll of a natural 20, I roll like a five. Mm -hmm. You know, and he's like, Shuck! and pulls it out. Blood is like <laughs> squirting out like a fountain. You know, the, the the big bad villain, you know, cult leader is like, Ugh! you know, his, his followers, including the demons, are like, what, what happened? What what happened? You know, this is a as non combat guy as you can get. Mm -hmm. And the player was just really thinking. He took a wild stab at at literally <laughs> yeah. turned a tide yeah. of, of the whole thing. You know, because without the you know, the guy falls over dead in a minute, you yeah. know, and and you know the his henchmen are all like, uh, you know, the demons are like, hey, the guy who's controlling us, he's dead. We get mm -hmm. to leave or go off into the world and cause mayhem. Cool. <laughs> you know, there's, they don't give a shit about him, so there's no. I'm gonna avenge the master. No, they're like, yeah, great, I'm out of here. Yeah. So speaking of turning the tide, uh, when. Ninjas and Super Spies <laughs> came out. Um, I had a lot of friends who were active in martial arts. Um, I had dabbled a little bit, but I came from the wrong side of the tracks and money was not paying for martial art classes in our house. Yeah. Uh, and over the years, the folks I've introduced Ninjas and Super Spies to who actually have either martial arts or combat sports backgrounds, uh, like I did in the 90s, uh, have always been very impressed with the combat system. Because beyond the special martial arts powers, which uh, whoever was the Hong Kong cinema a file in the office was definitely doing their homework on Ninjas and Super Spies, but the very small but important change of melee range for combat has been like when I'm talking to folks who have actual fight experience or, or like myself or mixed martial arts or traditional martial arts, it's that small but important change really makes the game what it is. So many role-playing games have tried to do martial arts and then try to figure out how to balance out so, so people just aren't constantly spamming most powerful attack and that stuff. Was that all Eric's work or was that a group, a group thing of how to modify the Palladium combat rules with these small tweaks that made it so uh, a Wing Chun short ranger could actually hold their own with a taekwondoist who's gonna just stand at long range and try to kick you over and over again where where did that thought stream come from um i it was uh sort of both of us I, again part part of what we do is research the shit out of everything 
And and then Eric, in fact, you mentioned Taekwondo. I think that was one of Eric's, that was his third martial art. Mm-hmm. So Eric had some firsthand experience with that. Julius was a third degree black belt in Aikido. So we would talk to actual martial artists. We would watch them perform. We would watch, as you pointed out, Hong Kong movies and stuff. I was a big Bruce Lee fan. Mm-hmm. Heck yeah. Um, and we would research things like, like, like crazy and then try to incorporate and that actual change in the rules was Eric, but we talked about it and I said, yeah, Eric, it makes total sense. That's why for, you know, if you read a lot of our games, there's little tweaks, little nuances, little changes for that particular setting mm-hmm. because it, it, it makes sense. And so, yeah, I was mostly Eric, but yeah, we, uh, and I had to go through it. Like it was, it was like, I, I still think some of the bonuses are a little high, but, but Eric, <laughs> Eric really wanted to go that way. And, and that's reduced. I went down and reduced all, everything. Mm-hmm. But yeah, we, we really, really like to discuss things. We have a different approach to stuff. Like, uh, it was interesting. We recently had a, a Zoom meeting with, with Sophie Campbell because she's writing one of the adventures in, uh, for, you know, she's writing one of the adventures that will be uh, the digital bonus adventure. We wanted to see if we could surprise people and have it actually into one of the books, but mm. she's just so slammed right now she can't. Mm-hmm. And she's and I had I had Sean sitting in with me, and she's like, "Well, how do you guys? How do you want to do this? You want me to write an uh, outline? Do you want to write an outline, Kevin? Because we're supposed to write it together." And I said, "I I like to work kind of differently. I like I like to. I mean, yes, we'll want an outline eventually, but I said let's just let's just spitball ideas." And talk about where things could go, what we want to do. Uh, she was like, "Oh, okay. I've never really worked that way, but let's let's give it a shot." By the end, it was just great, and she's like, "I love this because <laughs> it's it's very collaborative." Because none of us, the way I kind of work, and I, and in my mind, this kind of ties back to to comic books and 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 Heroes Unlimited. I always heard stories about how Stan Lee worked where he would sit down with his artists like we are now and uh, talking to, together and we would he would they would spitball ideas and he'd give them a plot outline of what he was thinking and then the artist would turn into art and he'd look at it and go yeah this is pretty good but change this page or change this panel and then the artist would go in and finish it up and turn it in and Stan would then go in and write the actual dialogue and it was much more cooperative than a fully finished script handed to somebody to to illustrate uh, and I always thought that was kind of cool, uh, being a Marvel head, you know, mm-hmm. you know, and, and, and I like that approach. I actually had someone involved in Hollywood say that I, I think and function very much like a director, which is very cooperative. And I've heard directors talk, you know, give interviews and talk, and, and the really great ones are like, yeah, I don't give a, a, a crap of where the idea comes from, I don't care if it's from the cleaning guy, from, you, you know, the, the, the boom operator, from Aunt Matilda, you know, if it's a great idea, then I'm going to try to incorporate it. And, and that's the way I work. I mean, I, I get excited by the ideas. And so like Sophie mentioned some stuff. And the cool thing of that is, like, like Sophie said, you know, I had this idea for this and that. I don't know what you're going to think of it. And, you know, I've got this character and I, I want to name him this. And I'm like, oh, that's great. And then she's like, yeah, yeah, I was thinking of doing this. And we're like, mm, I don't know about that. And Sean's like, how about this? And she's like, oh, that would be great. And I'm like, oh, I love it. And at the end, we had this great thing, you know, and she's going to sit down and write it. And I'm going to go over it and, and tweak it and add stuff that I think needs to be added if necessary. And I mean, she's a master role player. I mean, she's, she's a, you know, runs like three or four freaking games every week, uh, mostly our stuff. So I think it's going to be excellent. She's an outstanding writer, but it was, it was just fun when you have, especially really capable people, really creative people. It, it, it's a blast. You know, I, I'm, I'm retweaking a palladium adventure for, um, Yin Sloth expeditions that, that, uh, John Klinkle wrote, you know, I was telling Sean about some of it and, you know, he goes, you know, maybe you want to, maybe don't make that a sword, why don't you make it maybe, a, you know, considering what the character is, maybe make it a pick. Maybe it's a dual pick because mm. uh, there's like snake ties in this, this guy, mm. like, like a minion of pith. 
you know and i'm like oh yeah and i can make it look like things Mm -hmm. and and, and then you know he had this other idea that i like you know and it's like haters and 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 jerk offs have tried to peg me as a control freak and anyone who's actually worked with me knows you know yes i'm a control freak in the sense of if you're doing something that's totally out of line with you know the setting or the characters or the power then i'm gonna say yeah what, what the hell are you thinking matt stop it but if it's a great idea, I want it, and I want you to be excited. And 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 we want, for me, and this is true of like apparently a lot of really good directors of films is ultimately I want the best product. Yeah, I want something that's going to be the most fun for for the players. Again, I don't care where that idea comes from or who comes up with it. Uh, you know, Chuck Walton used to be surprised by that because I guess he worked with a guy who not only would steal people's ideas, he'd take all the credit. Mm -hmm. Rude. Or poo-poo stuff. You know, if it's a great idea, it's a great idea. I want it, (laughs) you know? So sorry, I kind of went off on a tangent. no, no. We're actually here for the tangents. We're here for the tangents, as are (laughs) most of our listeners. How was Ninjas and Super Spies received when it hit the market? I wasn't sure how it would go because no one else had ever done anything like it. Mm-hmm. Um, not not really. And, uh, you know, there's Bushido, but mm-hmm. that's a mm-hmm. period game and it's oh, yes. really good. But it's, you know, so I wasn't sure how that would go. And uh, it was great. It sold very, very well. Yeah. If I'm correct, the only supplement that ever came out for it was Mystic China, correct? Yep. That is true. <laughs> Which... Uh, as a guess, <laughs> with a great Stranko cover, yeah, um, amazing cover. But who in Taoist? Who did you hire that was super into Taoist folklore for that? <laughs> so, so here's 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 the uh, a couple of interesting stories. So this cover was actually drawn. It was supposed to be the cover to Villains Unlimited. Oh. And Steranko turned us in. Jim Steranko was into pulp stuff and mm-hmm. like the shadow and, and you know, Fu Manchu and that kind of stuff. And I get this great painting. And it's funny, back in the day, I mean, he would actually mail me the freaking painting. Uh, and then we'd get transparency shot of it and stuff. But so I get this astonishing pair, painting and Eric comes running over. And on one hand, we're like, wow, that's amazing. On the other hand, we're like, Wow, that's not Heroes Unlimited mm-hmm. or, or Villains Unlimited. I'm like, so we got to do something with this <laughs> because I mean, I, I I want it. I love this painting. I want to use it. And I'm like, Eric, why don't you write a book? We'll call it Mystic China. You can extrapolate on all the powers and stuff in there. And Eric's like, uh, I'm I'm more of a Japanese guy. I mm-hmm. I, I don't. I don't know much about China. And I'm like, Eric, you're this great writer. Just do a little research. You'll bang it out. Mm-hmm. And he, I, I guess my, my pitch was so good. He's like, okay. And he walked out of my house thinking, how am I going to write this? I don't know anything about the Chinese culture. Mm-hmm. So like I said, we research like crazy. When I say we do research, I mean, we read like, hundreds of flipping books yeah and try to really capture the culture the mythology the you know and and find the cool stuff you know the wow factor and all this stuff so eric deep dived and eric's a maniac so he deep dives into chinese culture and reads i don't know how many hundreds of books to the point where he's actually going to the University of Michigan and getting permission to see their archival books that you cannot take out of the library. And he fell in love with China to the point where a, he wrote a great book. B he would spend like 10 years and living in China Mm -hmm. because he loved it and got Mm -hmm. work as, as a a first as an adjunct professor at the university of Hong Kong, I think. Mm -hmm. And then as a video game designer in, in, in working in the Hong Kong branch of Ubisoft, yeah, he, he would have, because of this book, he would have this love of China that to the point where he actually moved there and lived there for mm-hmm. a freaking decade. I never knew that. 
that's it's amazing. <laughs> yeah, he never told me either because I, you know, I <laughs> I was always I'm always very gung ho and high energy, right? Mm-hmm. And in my youth, e- even more so, Eric once said that I was like a runaway train going 90 miles an hour. And so you can't stop that train, but you can, if you're, if you're smart, you can derail, not derail, but <laughs> Steer. switch tracks yeah. and, and put me on another track and let me run down, down that, that trail and, and those ideas and maybe slow me down because mm-hmm. it's going up a hill. So for me, I was just like, yeah, Eric, you can do this. Mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, I, I don't know if I can. Yeah, of course you can. But Kev, no, Eric, you're you're brilliant. You're a genius. You can do this. Uh, uh, you know, okay. <laughs> I, I didn't realize. I mean, I felt kind of bad later because I, I'm like, oh, so I kind of rail, railroaded mm-hmm. you into that. I said I didn't mean to do that. And he's like, Kev. It worked out great. I love China. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's funny because uh, Mystic China is probably the only RPG book that my father ever did more than flip through. My parents were totally supportive of my role playing. Both my parents were huge Tolkien fans, yeah. and that. But my father, when he had been going to university basically had a undeclared minor in Asian studies with an emphasis mm. on Chinese China and uh, the how Taoism affected yeah. China China culture and drove the three kingdoms period etc cetera, etc cetera. he stole this one <laughs> this is one of two <laughs> items I had to go into his stuff and retrieve <laughs> <laughs> The other one being my Guns N' Roses tape. Oh, fair enough. <laughs> <laughs> because he just loved how well a certain period of Taoist folklore was really taken. And he described this book as uh, 80s martial arts movies got crossed over with Big Trouble in Little China. And yes. that's high praise. That high is, praise. Yeah, and he meant it as high praise too. And that, that was sort of our goal. Yeah. Um, so he, yeah, he, he nailed exactly what we were trying to do. Eric and I loved Big Trouble in Little China. It's yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's it's an amazing supplement. Um, you know, for for one of your game systems that only got one support book, mm-hmm. it, like amazing. Yeah, yeah. It, it you you knocked it out of the park. With well, that, that was Eric. Was. Yeah, that, yeah, that book is very much Eric. All, all I did was go through and edit it. it it's like 100% Eric Woodjick. Mm-hmm. Where Ninjas and Super Spies is about 80% Eric and, and 20% me. And, and Ninja Turtles is like nine, eh, 80, 90%. The writing is like 90, 95% Eric. Um, the game rules are about 60, 40, 60% Eric. Because uh, a lot of them yeah. were, were my ideas, and that was a great thing working with Eric, is we were always seemed like we were always on like the same wavelength, and we'd get each other excited. Yeah. So you know, we we'd walk away from a conversation, just chomping at the bit to dive right in and start writing and developing game rules and play testing, uh, which was beautiful. I and and I didn't realize how rare that was until yeah. Eric passed away. Uh, and that's why when I found it with Sean Robertson, I'm like, I'm hiring, I'm bringing this guy in. I even miss hiring. He's my partner. He's yeah. the next guy. He's the guy who's going to carry on because he's got the passion and we're on the same wavelength and mm-hmm. super rare. Yeah. It was a beautiful thing. I love, you know, it's, it's a little trite to say after that beautiful thing you just said. Um, but I love the cover <laughs> because it reminds me of an old like Remo Williams, Doc Savage cover. Yeah. And, yes. and like, that's exactly uh, what it is. It's, it's brilliant. I, I would, I would see this in the dollar like paperback bookstore and I would have picked it up. Mm-hmm. And if I had seen a cover like this, I would go, Oh, that's cool. Mm-hmm. And <laughs> I love that. It's by uh Stranko. Yep. It's, it's an am- amazing cover. Stranko did a lot of shadow covers for the mm-hmm. novels, mm-hmm. and I, I think a few uh, Doc Str- um, Doc Savage. Mm-hmm. Oh, so I'm not I'm not out of out of pocket there. That 
I no, no, it that's right. exactly no. You're dead on. That's exactly what it was. Stranko right. grew up. St- Stranko is, is a little younger than my dad, but I mean, he grew up on the pulps. Loved yeah. that stuff. We we would see him at conventions, you know, buying up pulp magazines and stuff in, in the seventies, mm-hmm. and uh, he loved that stuff. Excellent. So uh, that's exactly what it was. It was his homage, and that's why I said we, you know, and this is a great example of everything gives me ideas. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, we get a cover that's just not superhero mm-hmm. or super villain. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's villainous and intriguing and amazing. And then yeah. you look at it and all, it, all kinds of ideas start to pop yeah. into your head. It, it looks so 70s movie poster, too, in a it, way. It's, yeah. It screams novel to me, yeah, honestly. Yeah. yeah, it does. It does. The interior art on it is really good mm-hmm. as well. Agreed. Yeah. Well, let's uh, let's move to final thoughts for this for this era here. We've done heroes, ninjas, mm-hmm. and super spies, and you're you're starting. You've you've made your moves, and this is this is where you're going now. You're not going into uh, the uh, the Kamiko verse or <laughs> Kaliko Vision verse. Yeah, yeah. Um, right. You're 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 going in this direction that is solid and that's nailed down. Where do we go next? What's what's the next? What's the next bit? It's, oh it's, well, the next thing is Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, and this is where you really just explode, huh? Yep. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Well, one of the things I I really wanted to build my company, mm-hmm. and I wanted to enhance our our distribution. I, I and we'll talk about this some more in the next episode. But I, I always say there's only three reasons to, to to get a license. I think I mentioned this in the last mm-hmm. episode too, and it's either be and any one of these reasons is good. You love it. It's going to make you a pile of money and or it's going to open up doors for mm-hmm. you. And I knew if we got Ninja Turtles, we could get into the comic book stores. Yeah. Yeah. And same thing with Robotech. And, and so it was very deliberate and calculated. And, and in the case of both Turtles and Robotech, I was very fortunate mm-hmm. because I love the IP. I thought it could make us money. Although we didn't know, I mean, Turtles in particular was like brand new. Who knew yeah. knew where that was going to go? <laughs> and but I was confident if we did it right, it would open up new doors for us, and that's where we would go next. But I mean, yeah. I didn't know when we finished up, you know, with with Heroes Unlimited. Uh, I was focused on, uh, I was focused on, uh, you know, Palladium Fantasy and yeah. Heroes Unlimited. Mm-hmm. You know, and Turtles just seemed like a natural to go with Heroes Unlimited. Mm-hmm. Heroes in a half shell. Turtle you know, power. and that's the thing is, is like I said, I in my memory, issue number two came out in like December of eighty four, and that, maybe that's beginning correct. of eighty five. Yeah, yeah. And so, you know, again, it was just perfect timing. It's six, six, seven months after the release of Heroes Unlimited, mm-hmm. and I'm like, what's this? This would be cool. Yeah. 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 Well, well, thank you so much, Kevin. This is, I, I love these trips. I love these little journeys you take us on. And please do not feel like you have to stay on topic, on tangent. <laughs> I, I can feel NPC over there, but I'm, I'm the on tangent guy. <laughs> and and I, I love the stories and, you know, I, I want, I want all your fans to hear the stories. So thanks. Yeah. Yeah. And we'll talk about this the next episode, which is TMNT, but I, I want to give a, a shout out to uh, Jim Lawson, mm-hmm. Steve Levine, uh, Levine, and uh, Dan Berger. They they were at a, they're some of the original Mirai Studio artists, mm-hmm. and uh, they uh, they were at a local convention this weekend, and uh, we we went to see them. We actually invited them to come to our office, and they were disappointed that he didn't have enough time because oh. the convention was only like forty five minutes away, and yeah. uh, it was great seeing those guys. And you know, I'll, I'll share some stories next week. Excellent. Uh, we'll actually have a, a photo. Thank God, Sean. We were actually leaving. We had said our goodbyes, and Sean's like, "Oh shoot, we need to get a photo of us with with the guys." Mm-hmm. And I'm like, yes, "Absolutely." <laughs> so. That'll appear in the weekly update. I'll probably talk about that. Excellent. Speaking of which, uh, as we're wrapping up here, uh, any news or from Palladium you want to share and make sure our listeners are up to speed on? Um, the backer kit for the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, um, the pledge manager, that should go up soon. 
Uh, Sean and I have been a little frustrated that it's taking so long for it to go up. We're trying to nail down shipping rates mm-hmm. that are going to be accurate. And uh, we wanted to set it up so that when you made your pledge, you could pay for the shipping mm-hmm. all the, at one time. Yeah. And poor Wayne Smith, uh, while he's recuperating from his knee surgery, busted his behind to try to do that. And then our our because we're shipping, there's so many going out that we we actually bringing in a third party fulfillment company mm-hmm. that, to do it for us. And this guy actually called us up. When, when he heard we were planning to do this and begged us not to nail down the shipping rates because things are changing. And he's like, look, it's going to ship, you know, four or five months from now, you know, God knows what the shipping situation will be. Uh, I guess, you know, there's stuff going on with the Suez canal and mm-hmm. Panama canal and, you know, hopefully everything will be fine. Not, not just so we can ship on time and have, you know, low prices for shipping. Mm-hmm. But so there's not new wars and strife in the world. Yeah. Um, we don't need that that crap. So that should go up. Sean will kill me by saying, I hope sometime next week. Yeah. But I hope it'll be sometime next week. <laughs> oh, see, here he is. He heard it. Hey, Sean. <laughs> How y'all doing? We're doing oh, great. You would not believe the promises Kevin just made. <laughs> Oh, Kevin! Ah, should I go? <laughs> He's lying, Sean. <laughs> I hope you guys are having a good time chatting. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Good to see you. No problem. I was going to say, time's up, guys. Yeah. <laughs> um, is there anything we want to say? I was just saying, oh. you know, the, the pledge manager backer kit should hopefully go up very soon. Yeah, yeah. And I just, you know, that's one of those things that's really important to us. But, of course, uh, we, you know, we have different lines of people working on different stuff. So mm-hmm. Wayne and Christopher Landau have been working really hard on finalizing that um, and getting it up for everybody to see. We also want to make sure that we have reasonably accurate, as of right now, mm-hmm. shipping projections yeah, available that's for, what I was just for everyone. Yep. Yeah, and um, and so that and, and it, it has been, uh, I guess, the, I guess the toughest part of the cookie to crack yeah. for yeah. our guys. Um, but you know, because Kevin and I are really <laughs> focusing on on production and stuff on the books. So that's so that's kind of how that's been going. Uh, we wanted it to be up a couple of weeks ago, but yeah, yeah. Um, it should be should be very soon. Should be very soon. We're, yeah. we're finalizing a lot of stuff, but it's it's just complicated. It's really complicated oh, yeah. math. Yeah. And I mean, <laughs> I don't know if we've ever. I could go on for a while about the EU and UK and VAT and all the different countries and. Yeah. It's just it's it's but we're working with really great sharp people and yeah. uh, that that uh, well, it looks like we're going to spiral galaxy again and uh, some other yeah, for overseas uh, for overseas yeah. mm-hmm. yep again so they were very popular last time so and then arc trans is going to be our fulfillment company for oh. domestic canada and canada and they, they have the part of that's because they're really great for canada yeah besides they have a great reputation and you know the guy running the show there is uh, a, a big Palladium fan. Yeah, and reached Excellent. out to us during yeah, Titan yeah. Robotics. He's like, "Can I help you? Can I? What can I do?" You know, he's like, <laughs> "He's like, I didn't even ever think of talking to you about this until I heard you guys were, were having trouble with another another shipping partner." So, mm-hmm. but no, he's been awesome, um, and we're, we're we're really looking forward to things, um, and can't wait to show off a lot of the the miniature sculpts and stuff. Oh, yeah. Yes, a lot going to be available. Yes. Yeah, we'll we'll um, talk and, about know, that in our next because uh, so. the next the next subject is. Uh, TMNT, so I'm inviting my tongue. Down. Oh, sorry, I didn't mean to jump <laughs> ahead. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I mean, it's just that's that's part of the big things. I was talking to a fan. We were at this con yesterday. I don't know if Kev mentioned it to you. Yes, and, he did. Um, it was just like it, I was like, yeah. By the end of this, I think I'll have three months of just pure coordinating art and mm-hmm. for for art direction and approvals and 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 that's, that goes for Kev too. He's been working on this for months. You know, um, lining up all these artists and. And and so it's been, it's been great, but mm-hmm. uh, just really busy. <laughs> so well, well, part of it, you know, it's it's like it, it's not a matter of Palladium doing the approvals. You know, mm-hmm. we have to get approvals from Paramount, and so we've got something like like thirty artists contributing, uh, you know, tribute pages. And, yeah. and so the thing is, you know, that sounds like a lot, but then you got to think, okay, so first. They've got to submit three sketches that Paramount has to approve. Yeah, yeah Paramount picks one of the sketches, and, and then maybe they've got feedback, and, we, and we'll tell them day. which sketch we like as well. Yeah. But the whole point is, and and there's a lot of good reasons for it. We got a lot of rabbits, for instance. Mm-hmm. People like mutant rabbits. I don't know. 
Oh, really? Mm. <laughs> mm. Rabbits, you say. And then they have to <laughs> do, you know, the artist has to submit the final pencils and then, and, and you go through approval for that. And then you got to submit the final ink. So you get approvals yeah. on that. Mm-hmm. And then, so, and, and then, then might you got to get the, that goes the, back and forth, right back right? and forth. And then you get the, the color. So, I mean, that's 30 artists times like four or five or six yeah. steps. It's, it's a ton yeah. of, of work. But, you know, so, Kevin and I are talking about, it. I mean, it's just so worth it for this product. Because I told Kevin, I was like, I'm never doing this again. <laughs> <laughs> but it's so worth it for the Turtles. Yeah. It's a really special event. And so we really wanted to do this with these. I'm, I know it's a book, not an event. But for us, it's a huge event. Well, it is right? sort of an event. because yeah. yeah. I mean, it's, the Kickstarter you know, itself was an event, right? And it's it's the event. 40th anniversary this year of, yeah. of, of Team and T. Um, right. You know, I, I, can't, I can't. And we can talk about more of this next week. Yeah, but yeah. Or, next time we we have a meeting um for the podcast but you know these guys you, you know jim lawson and 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 steve levine and uh, sure. dan berger they, they were just so happy that we included them and we're like yeah. of course we would include you guys i mean you're part yeah. of the original yeah the original team it's just been tough to wrangle with everything else oh, yeah. going yeah and so um but yeah no we uh we're really excited about everything getting set up and i don't mean to derail everything but uh i just want to jump in and say hi to you guys and no it's great all. to see you man. <laughs> I, i'm glad uh, that you have a, a competent backer a backer kit partner and a fulfillment partner i Having heard some of the horror stories of folks in Canada, uh, our 228 listeners from Canada on the last episode will be incredibly happy to hear yeah. that well, you have someone who's competent at the helm. Yeah, and, 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 and you know, and some companies have different abilities, right? And right. so we're trying to make sure that we're using the pinch hitters. Uh, like Sprawl Galaxy was just, they just nailed it, especially with the UK mm-hmm. and the EU. And that, EU yeah. and that can, like I said, that can, that's, I mean... <laughs> Is a whole other thing. I mean, they, 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 each country needs stuff filed in their in their language, right? And they they all have different rates, Laws and rates and and terms, and different and items yeah. that they'll they'll tax different ways. I mean, it's insanity. Yeah. And so they were great for that. But you know, I think that uh, we're, we're looking at uh, working with um, Jeff Sheets at Art Trans, and Art Trans is really great for the Canadian side of things, shipping from the U.S. Yeah. And you know, we know that was a big pain point for a lot of people. And so, yeah, we're just looking to just to, to smooth out everything we can, the best we can. And, awesome. you know, you hope for the best. It's not always perfect. And right. shipping especially is always changing. So we can't, uh, you know, we're going to have to wait to charge the shipping and things like yeah. that. But we're trying to get really, really accurate estimates as so of right So they now. know what they're, they're exactly. Yeah, so, you know, it could go up, down, could go down a little bit, but it should be a right yeah, in there. it could there. go up a little bit, but, you know, we mm-hmm. don't know. And, and another thing hopefully people realize is that these books are heavy. You know, they're hard covers yeah. on yeah. the paper. So and that does that does add up weight compared yep, to yeah. you know the the perfect bound books that uh, that you might be used to. So mm-hmm. anyway, it's all it's it's all pretty good. Um, fortunately, the the minis aren't very super heavy, and you know um, and they're but, amazing and they're amazing. Yeah. But anyway, everything adds up. A lot of guy, a lot of fans are getting a lot of stuff. So yep. um, I think in the end, though, they're going to be really happy with, and you, you you'll be able, I mean you'll be able to tell that that uh, you're getting a good deal. We're we're, we're 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 yeah we're shaking our money maker to try and make sure that that happens. <laughs> so, um, and we got and that's one of the great things about bringing in Chris Landauer. That's one of the great yeah. things about mm-hmm. having Wayne work on this stuff is is it is uh, we can get these good deals while yeah. Kevin and I are still able to focus on production. Yeah. And well, and that, that sounds super awesome, and I'm able to yeah. glad that we're going to be able to let our folks know that it's coming real soon, and the light is starting yeah. to appear at the end of the tunnel. Yeah, it should be super soon. And of course, we have to get, you know, we'll do an official update on the Kickstarter. We have to get that approved with Paramount, you know, yeah. and just mm-hmm. hopefully fans understand that it's not just the same as us making a comment in a forum or something yeah, right. or on a, a on a podcast offhand. But uh, but yeah, and, and the other thing is that, you know, a uh, little bit of delay there hasn't slowed down the production on yeah. the books themselves and yeah. the coordination with artists and stuff. So just so fans understand that it's not like there's some some log jam behind the scenes they don't know about. So. Yeah. Excellent. Okay. Excellent. Well, thank you so I'll much. I'll you guys gentlemen. to it. Yep. <laughs> it was good chatting. Cheers. See you later. Cheers. Well, thanks again for joining us, Kevin. And thanks, Sean, for jumping in and giving us all of that awesome information, which we are excited to talk about in greater detail. Uh, in next just time. a moment. Yeah. 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 <laughs> I mean, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm happy because, you know, it seems like a lot of um, 
interviews we do is always on what's the latest. And that's, that's cool. And we're happy to talk about that, mm-hmm. but yeah. it's nice to be able to go in depth yeah. about, you know, yeah. what we were thinking or what I was thinking at the time when we were originally making a book, you know, mm-hmm. 30 or 40 freaking years ago. I don't know if you realize how much of a, of a touchstone for, for my generation specifically, your books were. Mm-hmm. D&D was a thing. Battletech was kind of a thing. But everyone, everyone was talking about Rifts, Robotech, and Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. And that was something that could go to our cafeteria in our book bag with our mismatched dice, and we could play. Mm-hmm. And the, it, was, it was a huge, huge deal. And yeah, I get, I get in the culture we have now, everyone wants to hear about what's coming, what's new, what's next. Produce, produce, produce. But I, I think... I think there is a bit of people out there yeah. who want to hear the history of it. And I, I think it's great. And I thank you so much for taking this time with us. Yeah. Well, thank, no, I, I, I agree with you. I, I uh, you know, obviously at the time that we were making this stuff, we had no idea yeah. what, what a profound impact we, we were having on our audience. But in, in, you know, recent years, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm just, shocked and humbled by the impact we have had on on so many people and and how much our work has inspired people i I mean you know and then like the big name people you know the the founder of of blizzard yeah you know they flew me in in 2010 to talk to their their uh workers their their community Mm -hmm. uh about world building and you know they had their whole own little auditorium and you know, there's like 350 people come to hear me talk about world building. I'm like, yeah. holy crap. And then I, I walk into the founder's office and there's a shelf full of my books, mm-hmm. you know, Mechanoids, Robotech, uh, you know, Heroes Unlimited, a whole bunch of stuff. And, and, and I'm like, holy crap, you play my stuff. He's like, are you kidding? You are my inspiration. Oh, and I'm like, yeah. what? Can I get a percentage of Blizzard? <laughs> <laughs> That's not what it used to be, but I mean, it's still something. <laughs> you, know? you know, it was just, it was amazing. You know, yeah. Ross Marshall Thurber, you know, he's becoming a big shot director. He's working on the, the D&D mm-hmm. streaming series. He, you know, did uh, Red Notice, which was the most watched original Netflix movie ever. Uh, he's done a bunch of other stuff, you know, we, we meet and he tells me how, you know, I'm the reason he's a writer director because yeah. real wise playing Ninja Turtles and Heroes Unlimited and riffs that he loved telling stories. Yeah. And, it, and, and the stories just like they tend to resonate, uh, especially with with my group. And I think that's where we should probably leave it is just that. It's just that it's like we've, we've sat and we've, we've gotten it and it's just, God, I'm just really glad you're doing this. Thanks, Kevin. Yeah, thanks, Kevin. <laughs> Me too. Thank yeah. you for, thank you for doing it. Yeah. I, I, I am very grateful. Yeah. Yep. Um, so let's call it here. We'll, we'll see you next week or well, is it next week? Not quite certain. We'll, not, work, out okay. the we'll work out the details. Yeah. yeah. But again, thanks so much, Kevin. Thank all of you out there, all of our listeners. And we'll be doing this again. And this trip down memory lane for all of us has been wonderful. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks again. Cool. Starships, magic, mystic martial arts, romance. All of these can be found in A Cloak of Blades by Isaac Sher. You might have heard my name before. I've done a lot of voiceover work for Breakfast Puppies. And I've recently released my first novel. It's available on Amazon as an ebook and paperback, and you can get it for free if you have a Kindle Unlimited subscription. I do hope you'll support my work as you're supporting Breakfast Puppies. And it's been a pleasure talking with you today. Have a good one. You've been listening to The Glitter Boys, a Palladium Books fan podcast. Glitter Boys, Rifts, The Megaverse, and all other such topics are the property of Kevin Sambita and Palladium Books. 
Please buy all their stuff and help keep them in print and making more games. You can order directly at palladiumbooks.com and their entire catalog is available digitally at Drive Through RPG as well. Our opening music is 8-Bit Bass and Lead by Furby Guy from freesound.org. This closing music is Caravana by Philip Gross, available at freemusicarchive.org. All sound effects used are self-made or acquired via Creative Commons Zero License. If you like what you have heard, find us on Twitter and Facebook as The Glitter Boys. That's B-O-I-S. And check us out online at breakfastpuppies.com slash glitterboys. And also join us on the Breakfast Puppies Network Discord at breakfastpuppies.com slash discord. And if you want to help us out, please spread the word and help us build a community. Thanks again for listening. We'll catch you next time.